-hmm. Hello, hello, hello. And I am so grateful to God for my brother here. I was having a moment, Commissioner. I was watching all this stuff on TV and I got really emotional and getting sad and my emotions. And then I thought, I, I know a real man that's in politics that don't have two sides. He's who he is because I've known him for some years and I got encouraged because what I'm watching on TV mm. is hurting my heart. But anyway, right. so I thank you, Commissioner, Vice Mayor. And let me tell you, I'm gonna let you talk, I promise. But awesome. when I looked on the Facebook, Mm -hmm. I knew you was the Covington commissioner. Mm -hmm. And I have a scripture this year. It's Ephesians 3, 20, 21. It mm -hmm. says he'll give you more than you can think I asked for. And then I went on the Facebook looking to see the covenant. And it said the vice mayor. <laughs> I was like, ah, that, that ain't a more than you can think I asked for. The brother ran for commissioner. And here he is, got a vice mayor. <laughs> Won't he do it? So anyway. I'm going to let you introduce yourself, and I'm just so excited because it gives me hope even the more because your character and reputation match, mm -hmm. and I would know if it didn't because I've been knowing you and watching you for a while, a whole long while, so I praise God for that, and like I told you, man, when you was running, I was like, man, I wish I could vote for him over here, and I put it on the Facebook. I'm like, man, I wish I could. <laughs> But God didn't need my vote. He got you in there. Okay, so I'm sure you go on. And who are you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for thanks for interviewing me. I appreciate that, and thanks for the prayer before we started. Um, I, I'm Ron Washington. I, I'm in Northern Kentucky. I'm I'm from Covington, uh, sort of, kinda. Uh, well, I guess we'll get that to that a little bit later, um, but. Uh, you know, I'm a product of a single mother household, and uh, I, I was a police officer, and I retired from that, and I became a business owner, and I've been a volunteer for various things out in my life, and now I am uh, a city commissioner for the city of Covington, and because I was the highest vote getter, my fellow commissioners uh, felt uh, to follow tradition, and they voted me to be the vice mayor. So I'm the vice mayor of the city of Covington. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's that Ephesians 3, 2021. 20, More than you can think or ask for. Won't he do it? But anyhow, um, commissioner, do I say vice mayor? Mm -hmm. Or I can be as proper. I can be whatever I want to be. But anyway, I want to give you all the respect because it's due, you have paid the price and paying the price. Because like I said, watching this stuff on TV, you are paying a price, brother. But anywho, mm -hmm. if you can think way back or just yesterday for your <laughs> first heart smile, internal, not just, you know, hi, how are you? Good day to you. But uh, one that's down in there that, that, that you can recall that made your internal just smile on the inside. Wow. Wow. Oh, that's, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I, I think that that's a, a character building exercise, you know, that, uh, you kind of see where you, you, you need to be and you, 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 you want to be in life. Uh, so I guess the, the, the first heart smile, um, that I, that I got was from my mom, you know, uh, as we're talking, I'll talk about mom. Mom is the person that adopted me. Yeah. Uh, my birth mother is, is my birth mother. But I guess, you know, I was young, I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And there was a person that was in, in some criminal trouble. And I told her, this is what we should do. And she said, uh, she questioned me about it. And I told her a little bit more about what I thought should happen. And she encouraged me to call the courthouse. And I called the courthouse about this person and about this situation. And believe it or not, back then I was able to get the judge in the judge's chambers. And I explained to him about the situation and it was actually a relative. And uh, he told me what to do and, and things. And uh, we got the situation taken care of. So when I hung up the phone, you know, back then we had these things with wires attached. We don't have, <laughs> you know, we don't have these big bricks that we carry everywhere. <laughs> And uh, when I hung up the phone, uh, mom looked at me and she says, you know, you're, you're, 
you're you're a very smart person and you know how to take care of business and how to how to talk to people and i guess that was my first you know smile and kind of it's kind of said to me that uh you know looking back at it that maybe i i should work in the community more and work for people when i got older and mature so that probably helped yeah you were 12 oh yeah i was pretty i was pretty young uh when, when the incident took place i was i was young but uh, i and i don't you know i i was i've always been a a big reader of local news and and uh current events and things like that and i was always interested in the uh, criminal justice system so I, I guess that's where I, I picked it up from. That's deep. That's deep. That's good stuff. And look at this smile. I love those first memory because they get no matter what life does, it still can come out and bring a smile. Praise oh. God. All right. So you mentioned you were adopted. So how old were you when you got adopted and how did you react? when you found out or did you know you were getting adopted or you found out later or how did that happen? Right. Um, well, I got a question for you before I start. Yes, sir. Because that, that tells me, tells me uh, how, how short or long the story should be. Oh, uh, boy, it's our party. Okay. okay. We, it's our party and I'm learning how to edit. This is uh -huh. our party and I paid a year for Zoom thing and, <laughs> so and you're, I'm grown. Okay. We got so, it. So I, I was uh, I was born in Middlesboro, Kentucky, uh, outside of Harlan, Kentucky. My oh, yeah. That's an interesting area. Yeah. Don't tell me. Are you from there? No, I got ran out of Harlan, Kentucky one time. I went up there and then people got to look. Well, that's another story for another time. <laughs> and every time I hear Harlan, Kentucky, it makes me twitch because somebody said you need to get up. I came out of them hills quick. Oh, yeah. And they yeah. said it wasn't racial. You either belong or you don't. And I got up through. But yeah. anyway, I, yes. I, I believe that. So, <laughs> um, so come to find out, um, I guess I was three days old when uh, uh, I moved from uh, Harlan, Kentucky, or Middlesboro, Kentucky, to uh, Northern Kentucky. I was brought to mom's house. And like I said earlier, you know, mom's my adopted mom. My birth mother is is my mother when I when I talk, so um, I was actually not adopted until around the age of five. But I I always stayed in the same home, and that was mom's house, and that's the only mom that I knew. So I was I was I was raised in I was raised in Covington. So I got up here approximately three days three three days old. So, um, but but it was never a child. You know, it was never a. Um, it was never a secret or anything that I was adopted. It was it was never that. Mom never kept that from us, uh, from me. Uh, mom was a, a foster mother. Many children uh, came through the home, and um, but she adopted me, and it was never a secret. Uh, you know, my actually, you know, uh, my last name. I was born with the last name of Mentor, so my last name is actually Mentor. Well, that's the name I was born with is Mentor. So Rob Ronald Mentor, and uh, so so that's 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 me. Now later on in life, you know, I did uh, I did meet my birth mother, and I'm um, very good friends with my birth mother and my birth family and my birth father's family and and all of that. Man, you are unique. I might have to jump through the screen and pinch you because that <laughs> don't even seem real. <laughs> yeah. Normally, people will have a little attitude, a little flavor, or, but that's amazing. No wonder, mm -hmm. Ryan Washington. Man, yeah. I learned of you. It had to be 14, 15 years ago. I would hear things, and I would hear it, and you were the kindest person oh, to my man. grandbabies, and to this day, I haven't heard anything negative about you, <laughs> which is unreal, but I could see because you're pretty transparent, but what just amazes me is your heart when did you well you just told me when you was 12 kind of sort of when you realized of this servant heart where you were just always my mother you i don't know if you ever met my mom before she passed she was crazy about you because she was really close to Ange, and i was still being you know hey i wasn't cha-cha then i was who i was so anywho <laughs> 
mama would talk about you and she and Ange and my babies loved you so much. So how did you, I got, okay, I'm going somewhere. I'm yeah. really, I'm just reminiscing. This is the month my mother passed. So a lot of memories come to heart because she told one year it was Christmas and she said, baby, that's what she called me, baby. The grandkids are going to have a Christmas. They've got toys. Mm. Woo. And I'll never forget that. And But later in life, as I began to know you and having the opportunity to have addiction all around me, mm. how did you start wanting to help people that, that business that use? Because normally when you have an addict in your family close to you, folks ain't fooling with you. They ain't fooling with you or the family. And then I kept hearing, I didn't still know you that well, but you know, I, I like the kids call ear hustle. I ask questions, <laughs> I be an investigator. Right. And I heard you had a place over there and you was helping people with addicts and stuff. And then I thought I like him a whole lot because he's helping the least likely. How you get turned on to helping drug people? Well, you know, it's interesting job because you know, my, my professional life, um, you know, I, I was a police officer and as a police officer, the way uh, that we kind of look at things is we never put ourselves in other people's shoes as police officers because it's hard to enforce the law. If you're if you're always, you know, if, if, you, if you think, well, I know how this person, I can understand why they did this or I can understand. So it's a mindset. So after I retired from a uh, and, and I was in plain clothes too. So we, in plain clothes, we, we, we set up, we would set up various drug deals using informants and things like that. And uh, so I kind of, um, you know, I, I actually prided myself in arresting uh, people with drugs, you know, and not until after I retired, I, I met a physician friend of mine that was my primary care doctor. And, um, he, 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 we talked and he told me that he had a desire to open up a clinic, a medication assisted treatment clinic to help people that were on opioids. And that was also um, people that uh, were on heroin and things like that. Now this is before, you know, we know what the problem is today. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, I think you have the gift to open this place in Northern Kentucky. And I looked at him and I said, those people, I don't want anything to do with those people. But you got to remember, I'm coming from the frame of a police officer. And so every time I go in the office, he'd bring this up to me. You, we need to do this. We need to do that. Well, finally, what happened is I sat back and I started reading about addiction. And I became self-taught on, uh, on the, the process of addiction and why people are addicted to certain things. And it, it, you know, and the light bulb came on. You know, a lot of times, especially when I'm talking about opioids and heroin and things, you know, people want to want to want to classify people as that. You know, uh, they got in it, they can get out of it. You know, things like that. Well, no, they can't. Okay, uh, very few people, and this is backed by statistics. Very few people actually can get out of it. Did they get in it? Yes, they did get in it. But people don't understand. They get in it after one or two times, they can they can become addicted, um, and the the high has long been gone uh, with these people that are continuously addicted. And only thing they want to do now I'm talking about opioids is they no longer want to be sick. And what they've done is they've changed their brain chemistry, and they no longer want to be be sick. And they do the most awfulest things uh, to themselves and to the people that love them. And um, it's, it's, it's sad to watch. It's, it's real, really sad to watch. So as I'm reading this, you know, I thought to myself, all the people that I've arrested, I think I may have gotten this wrong um, because I started, you know, I, I started really thinking about it. Did I get this wrong? Uh, because we, we, are, we are trained not to look at it from their perspective because we can't do the job. So um, I decided that uh, this was going to be a mission. I wanted to bring it to, to our hometown who, who had a, a strong need for a well-run clinic. And, you know, and, and being treated as a human being and this being treated 
as a medical issue. Um, statistics have bared out that this is the best way to handle this. So it was a long journey uh, opening up the clinic. A lot of people questioned me personally if I was addicted to drugs or, or had uh, someone real close to me that was addicted. And the answer was that I, no, I, I was not addicted, but of course I had people around me that were addicted. We all have them in our family and people don't understand that, but they're right there with us. And we have them in our family, we have them in our neighbors. And I, you know, I was raised on the rough side of town. So I, you know, I knew who was selling, I knew who was using, and you could see these peer, people deteriorate over, over the years. So yeah, it, be, it became a mission to open. It became such a mission to be honest with you that I had to sue in federal court uh, because uh, the city did not want um, the, the clinic. They, they did not, the neighbors, they, they felt there was a need, but they didn't want it in their area, not in my backyard. So I wound up suing and we won. Uh, it was it was successful. I no longer uh, I'm associated with the clinic, but it's it's still doing uh, uh, doing well. Unfortunately, it's doing well, and uh, a lot of people are getting help. Hey Amen. That's good stuff. Because to hear you were like music to my ears. Because working in public housing, you see how people are treated by the law enforcement, and it, it was amazing what you would see, and if they were an addict and they ended up dying, it would be justifiable homicide, or justifiable this, or justifiable, and it hurt my heart, and I thought, this is unreal. How is he doing? Why is he, what's happening? But then it was like, thank you, Lord. I don't understand, but by having it so close to me, I'm like, sure. thank you, Jesus. There's somebody out there that cares. And so yeah. I just, you know, I'm, I might have to come over to Covington to pinch you because the more <laughs> I hear about you, because when you said you were an undercover officer, and I remember seeing you maybe like 15 years ago, I had a fashion show, a style show for the kid, and you're the biggest somebody I ever seen. Yeah. And I thought, this is the biggest man walking up in here, and May May them was so happy to see you. But you talking about huge, so how'd you go on to cover anything? How you, you well, so big? Well, if you remember, I said we used informants. So oh. I was the guy that would, you know, we would have someone that uh, had knowledge of criminal activity and that we would then use the informant. So oftentimes uh -huh. I would be sit back, I would sit back in the, the vehicle. Yeah. And other officers that uh, are uh, more mainstream than my six, seven self <laughs> could get closer to the situation. But believe it or not, they would tease me. My partners would tease me over the years because I would mess around and I would, you know, I would be in an area of town that was known for drug trafficking and I would see somebody and I'd ask them if they'd have some drugs for sale and I'd, you know, and then, you know, my partners would just shake their heads because they're like, they know who you are. They're not going to sell it to you. Well, one time I saw a guy, I was in an apartment building and I asked him if he had any drugs to sell and just knowing that he's going to say no, Officer Washington, I don't because uh, that's happened before. And uh, he said, yes, he said, yes. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. He said, but it's right upstairs. I'll take you. And he walks me in, and me and the partner, he walks me in and uh, he tells the guy, the guy's in the kitchen. He says, I guess somebody wants to buy some stuff. He says, okay. And the guy turns around and he goes in to get his stash and he turns around and he sees me and he says, <laughs> Officer Washington. And I said, hey, how you doing? <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so it did happen. So, so the joke was on my partners and things like that. Yes. Yeah, that but, is uh, hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Hilarious. So, but I used, I, so I, I used informants and the, and the other officers were a lot. I was the senior officer involved. So, I was running the show in the background. So that's, that's what it was, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Because when you said that, and I thought back all those years, I'm like, you can't go undercover anything, uh, oh, no. you know. But anywho, question. If you were in this arena, this culture, this climate that we're in now, as a 13-year-old, young Black brother, what advice would you give him? Tell yourself, uh -huh. would you give yourself? 
What kind of advice, based off my life, what would I do? You know, the Bible say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And I just ask him to create in me a clean heart. Oh, God, and renew a right spirit within me. Now, I'm not no preacher or anything, but it's all about purifying your body, keeping your heart clean, keeping your heart pure. Thank you, God, for keeping a clean heart in me. I ask for your blessing. Amen. King of kings, all time creator He can get you through whatever He the only one can save you Never leave you, never stray you Always kept food on my table Keep my heart pure, this my prayer Leave me